Uh, since then, David has been uh, uh, producing a lot of work and especially great amount now in the, in the beginning of this uh, new millennium. Um, he has um, come up with another major system that actually he has basically built from ground up, which is called a giver of names, uh, a system which then has been also seen, has mani manifested itself in a number of different uh, uh, installations and um, and one one particular work along these lines actually got the prestigious Golden Nika at the most important international competition of, of electronic arts at the Ars Electronica last year, a piece called Enchant. Um, and David is a very special kind of an artist in the sense that he's a, let's say he's a, a programmer person who really understands from the inside what this whole thing is about. But he's also a highly, highly accomplished visual artist. And uh, what's more, he's a writer who's written a couple of really important and interesting theoretical texts dealing with the underpinnings of these new forms of uh, uh, art. So with this, uh, please help me welcome David Rockeby. Uh, I think I'm, I'm on to, well, I wanted to thank um, Eric and the rest of the, the uh, program here for inviting me. It's a real honor to be here. It seems like a really exciting program, and uh, I'm uh, happy to have this opportunity to, to present my work and some of the related ideas and practices to you. Um, it's always a bit of a problem now when I come to give a talk, because there's usually about an hour to talk and an awful lot to say. So I'm going to try to give you a sort of good sense of the of the, the the range and set of ideas and, and my work and try to connect it to to actual pieces so that it's not too abstract um, I yes as Eric said I, I used to have this yes used to announce myself as an interactive artist very directly and I think it's kind of uh, um, useful to know that I was thinking about myself in those ways before I ever used technology in my work that in the uh, early 80s, at art school, I was spending a lot of time thinking about the role of the audience in relationship to artworks, and it did not necessarily have anything to do with technological artworks. I was very interested in finding ways of engaging the memories and the fears and the imagination and the experiences of the people in the audience, directly involving them in the process of creation of the work. And I initially did that without any technology at all in a bunch of different uh, strategies involving folded pieces of paper and piles of, I won't go into it because it, I don't have enough time to go into that, but I started from a perspective thinking about engaging the audience and I came to decide that the most effective way for me to explore that was using technology. So that's, that's how I came to it. The first piece that, um, that I really uh, sort of explored, really in depth, explored these ideas is something that came to be called very nervous system. I'm always bad at coming up with uh, with names for pieces, so they usually have two or three names, uh, and eventually I find one I'm happy with, and then uh, I, I stick with that. And that makes a lot of uh, uh, masters and PhD students irritated when they're trying to look at my career. They say, "Well, so what was this piece called?" Well, you know, it was actually all these things. Um, but I'll, I'll talk a bit 
and show you, or I'll first show you probably some a very nervous system. Now, a very nervous system, it's basically a system that looks at body movement and translates it into, into music. And I was, at the time, really interested in the challenge that the computer presented to me. Um, I had started doing this with electronics rather than a computer. Once I involved a computer in my experiments with movement and sound, I was struck by a few things about the computer. And uh, as I'm a bit of a contrarian, I tried to, uh, to work against all these very specific things about computers. So one of the things is the fact that the computer did not seem to be addressing physical space at all. It was doing its thing on this sort of microscopic level of silicon traces and copper circuit boards. And I wanted somehow to, to take the activities that were going on there and project them out into real space. Secondly, um, all the oper operations of the computer were happening in, in accordance with very strict logical laws. And uh, I wanted to create a system where you communicated with it in a very visceral, gestural way. Um, and uh, so I explored this notion of deeply involving the body in interaction with the machine. So a very nervous system uh, evolved into something where a video camera or several video cameras look into a physical space looking at um, movements within the image. And if you think of a video camera as, as producing 30 snapshots a second, the computer grabbing those images, by simple comparison of the light levels at different parts of image at time one to the image at, at time uh, of the, the next frame, it's very easy for it to, to determine where the movement is. If my hand is here in frame one and my hand is there in frame two, it's a relatively trivial thing for the computer to figure out that there's been movement in this area. Then I, however, with very nervous system, I then look at that information across a longer sort of time span to look at qualities of gesture, uh, patterns of suddenness or continuous movements of high frequency or very slow continuous movement and attach different kinds and qualities of sound to those different characteristics. So I think I'll show you a bit of uh, tape of that. Now this was usually, this was occasionally used in performance, but it was most often shown as a gallery installation in an empty space. And people generally, without realizing what was going on, would walk into a space where suddenly their body was making sound. Um, and th what I'm going to show you is just me casually exploring um, the, the, the piece late in its development. Uh, the development started around 1981, and I sort of stopped working with it around 1990, 91. to go to here and I don't think you need to read this this is basically what I've already told you so let's see if I can <clears throat> 
there's a kind of an irony about this documentation, because I've seen this doc, and some of you probably have seen this documentation before as well. At a certain point, I can sort of hum along with that, which is really kind of antithetical to the whole notion of the piece, because the piece itself is something that, that is, a, is a collection of musical possibilities, and those musical possibilities unfold around the quality of your movement. But, of course, the documentation is now this fixed static thing, and it's very strange to show it, because I'm kind of like, oh, okay, here's the part where it does that. Um, now there are um, a few things that I, th I could talk for a long time about this piece, because I spent about 10 years working on it and with it, uh, and it is really pretty important to the whole of my career, because there are a lot of things I learned about the way we relate and think about computers when we're in the act of working with them that came out of the experience of showing this. Um, but I'll try to touch on just a few points. And if you're interested in pursuing that on my website, there are a lot of texts that talk more about some of those experiences. Uh, one of the important things to think about with this piece is that there is um, there's a very tight feedback loop. You're, you're making a movement, camera's seeing the movement, the camera's analyzing that movement and conjuring up a response and triggering the response and sending the sound waves out of the speaker to your ears all in less than a 30th of a second. And that's, that's fast, but what's interesting is it's a lot faster than consciousness operates. Uh, they've discovered that your awareness of your own movement lags behind the movement by about a tenth of a second. So in this piece, you're actually making a movement, the movement is generating sound, the sound is coming into your ear and your body before you're completely aware of the movement that you made that triggered it all. And in fact, because sound tends to sort of creep in under our consciousness and kind of get us moving a bit, your body is sometimes already responding to the sound that your own movement has made before you're aware of the movement that you've made. So there's a kind of floating relationship um, that you find yourself in with this, with this piece uh, where it's very unclear what's controlling what but where you feel kind of like you're floating. At its most extreme, it can get almost shamanistic. You can really get quite, quite carried away with that in, in what can be a very lovely way. Um, the second thing that's related to that is that uh, when you're in that space, it makes absolute, utter, coherent sense. Everything that happens feels right, feels connected to what you're doing. However, if you go into that space and try to control it, it's usually very frustrating. And that's largely partly because it's not, it's an interactive system. It's not a control system, right? A control system, you want that to do exactly, you want it to be repeatable, you want it to do exactly what you want. It doesn't really matter to you, the, the, the backward feedback doesn't matter because you just want it to sort of execute your commands. An interactive system for me uh, requires that there be some possibility that you affect it, but it also affects you. There's, there has to be a give and take system. And this particular system always works best when you're in that kind of frame of mind. Um, if you try to control it, it's very frustrating, actually. It drives you a little crazy. And as soon as you forget about it and let that go, it suddenly feels like it's completely connected and totally attached to, to your body. Um, a third thing that I'd like to say about this piece is it emerged, uh, uh, the ideas and the sort of the earlier manifestations emerged in the early 80s, 1982, 1983. And at that time, people were not thinking ab about interactivity at all for the most part. There were some people around doing that, but the average person coming to see this work was encountering an experience that they had no way of explaining. They'd walk into a space and people would say, the room was singing, my body was sounding. They'd have all these ways of describing it to themselves and it became an experience they were having in their body, in space and with the space at that moment, a very um, visceral, a uh, very sort of direct experiential thing. And, uh, and that was very rich because people would carry that experience out into the street with them afterwards. They would, the, the experience would leave a kind of um, resonance or an echo. And so as they walked through the street afterwards, they would feel as though every sound they were hearing was somewhat connected to their movements. A car would go by and splash through a puddle, but there was a feeling that you couldn't fight that that was somehow related to the swinging of your leg at that moment. There was a kind of uh, interesting sort of shadow or, or, or a sort of ghost of that experience that extended out and that was really interesting. Around 1988 when you got suddenly uh, Newsweek magazine with interactivity sort of on the front page and all the discussion of virtual reality, people suddenly had a completely different 
consciousness uh, and a completely different set of expectations, a set of and the possibility to understand sort of, gee, this may be related to something I read in Wired magazine, and hmm, there must be a computer involved. This was this was a totally different thing because people stopped having the the experience itself and started project using it as a springboard ahead into the future. Gee, wow, if you, maybe I could use this for my exercise, and it would be less boring than watching that tape over and over. And you know, in the future, this and that will be possible. And this was really quite complicated for me because the piece changed radically because the context changed around the piece. And suddenly, uh, a piece became a, a way of pe for people to imagine a kind of utopian future of democratic, beautiful interactivity. At exactly the time, in fact, that I had started to realize that there were a lot of rather disturbing things that, that revealed themselves in watching people interacting with these sorts of systems. Um, <coughs> There's not really time to go into all of those disturbing things. Uh, but I'll just give a little example. One, I think the first thing that struck me, um, in very early, very early, say 1984 versions of Very Nervous System, I was trying as hard as I possibly could to attach um, every parameter available in the synthesis as I was using to create sound to some attribute of movement so that the user had as as wide a possible control over the resulting sound as, as was feasible with the technologies I was using. And I kind of had this utopian idea that you know, this, giving this amount of freedom would make the sort of maximal interactivity possible, and that, that was kind of an ideal that, should be, uh, that I should strive for. And much to my uh, alarm and my disappointment, in a sense, um, it became clear that this was a very, very challenging system that most people found was not interactive at all. They tended to feel like it was essentially random. Uh, and I learned that as you reduced the sort of degrees of freedom, the numbers of parameters that people were controlling, they paradoxically felt they had more and more power. And actually, that increases until you reduce to actually quite a small number of parameters, at which point people feel the maximum degree of interactivity. And this, this shook sort of the foundations of what had been a kind of utopian notion for me, of interaction as this, you know, tremendous unleashing of potential, of empowerment, of all those words that we're a little uh, exhausted about hearing, I think, in terms of technology. But this was quite a shock to me, I think, and it forced me to look in different ways at the technologies I was I was working with, and uh, changed the way I thought about the place of these technologies in, in culture, and that. Uh, set of experiences, there are quite a lot of them which I've written about, um, really uh, set the stage for my later work. So let's see. Uh, one of the things most particularly that I found problematic in the end about Very Nervous System was very similar to something that I found most satisfying about Very Nervous System. This is a really exciting piece to show people, to, to sort of put on display, because people got overwhelmed, excited, uh, really, you know, really agitated and inspired by it, which is you know, always really nice as an artist to have people respond that way. But I found that people went away from the work often, not always, but often, with a, with, with a, a, a surprisingly trivial take on it. They, they, I saw this really neat thing today. And they didn't really take, didn't really pursue the issues that I felt it raised further. So I had to rethink also my strategy as an artist. This was very, this got me all over the world. It got me, you know, a lot of, uh, and I love this piece still, I have to say. But I found in the context of the 90s, it became, started to become a problem for me to show because it no longer, first the context had changed and my awareness of the issues had changed. Let's see if I can find my next cue here. And in fact, um, we're not going to see all of this transition. Oh, that's way later than I wanted to be. Let's see. Okay. Um, I'm just going to have to rewind while I'm talking to you. Um, I, just, I started to think about different ways of incorporating interaction into my work and ways of questioning and, and um, challenging notions of interaction. And uh, I started to hide interaction in my work. There would be interaction in the work, but no one would know it, but it was fundamental to the experience of the work, for example. Or I would create systems that were 50% interactive, 50% not, and created situations where there was a kind of a challenge to become literate, interactively literate. 
try to decipher what was actually reflecting you and what was built out of your desire to see interaction. Because we have very, very strong desire to, to, um, to see interaction in, our, in the experiences around us. OK, here we go. Um, so this piece, uh, watch, was also uh, stimulated by one other notion. Very nervous system is a surveillance system on a certain level. There's a camera that's looking at your body. It's looking quite intimately at you. Every part of your body is being watched, and every movement of your body is, is, is implicated in the, in the system. Um, but people didn't feel it like a surveillance system because it was sort of a beneficent, benevolent surveillance system. It never seemed threatening, and it never seemed to be gathering information or anything like that. None, whoops, sorry, nonetheless, it does, it did remind me as I was thinking about it and, and reading some of, um, some of the early uh, crit critiques of interactivity that there is this pro interesting problem. Interaction is impossible without surveillance. And that the more interactivity you want, the more surveillance you have to uh, give yourself to. And this creates a kind of an interesting problem to get the kind of what was, especially at the time, described as sort of the freedom of interactivity. You had to submit to absolute surveillance. There was this kind of interesting thing. So I, just, I wanted to explore surveillance in a, in a number of ways. I've never actually, however, had an uh, absolutely firm sense of, of how I felt about, it, about surveillance, because I have very mixed feelings. I like the, I, I'm a bit of a voyeur. I like the voyeuristic side. I like the, it's almost the witness side of watching other people and imagining their lives and feeling sympathy for them or, or whatever. I also, at the same time, uh, feel quite concerned about uh, the notion of machines judging people. So I have, and so I have, and of course, the privacy and control issues. So the first piece I did with Surveillance Watch is very much um, a com combination of all of these perspectives. And it's, uh, it, I think that the videotape mostly describes itself as like bad stuff if it's necessary. So this is a live camera looking out in the street outside of the gallery. Various processes applied to the images, um, mostly separation of motion and stillness, but sometimes other things as well. Uh, I think you'll notice coming up, there, will, there should be an extreme example where a van comes through on this side and you see virtually nothing. This van is almost invisible at this point. We're at the point where it's really divided or parts of the world into nouns and verbs. It's just two mutually exclusive sort of relationships of time. I really imagined this piece, uh, I called it Watch because uh, people had a tendency to come to all my work at this point and assume it was like very nervous system, so they'd walk into any of my pieces and start dancing around. It's a bit of a problem, so I called it Watch partly just to make people stop and sit and watch, but partly because it's actually, it's not really a piece you look at, it's a piece you look through. You're looking through it like a window out onto the street. It's the perceptual filters that are transforming your reading of this incredibly banal, you know, he's a squeezy kid about to clean someone's window, uh, completely banal activity on the street. And I, I was really struck by the way these, these are extremely simple mathematical processes. The way these mathematical processes change the experience of viewing that banal footage. The most extreme example of that, I think, was uh, the fact that on this street, at uh, various times of the day, there were often um, homeless people begging. And uh, often this, this street is pretty active, uh, generally, and so there's a lot of people moving back and forth. They generally tend to be invisible on this side, and often the only people visible are the people begging on this side. Now, I was at the time living on this street as well, dealing with homeless people outside my door every day, and I had learned to develop my own perceptual filters which would make those people disappear. I would walk down the street and they would not be present. And I found it very interesting that I could kind of construct with simple mathematics, simple mathematical operations on the image, 
a kind of inverse filter that seemed to carry with it a kind of socio-political commentary, um, which also interested me because these techniques have a relationship to notions of video compression, which is, of course, the big deal in getting video on demand and stuff like that. I was interested in the, the kind of interpretive level hidden within um, the kinds of analyses that are involved in, in things like compression. I think I'm going to skip ahead now because there's lots to cover. Um, the next piece I'm going to show you is a piece um, called the giver of names. Now, uh, it, through the 80s, I was predominantly interested in ways that the computer and computer technology were challenging the body and our, our relationship to our, to our body. In, uh, in the, at the beginning of the 90s, uh, I was interested in all the talk about um, virtual, you know, like agents, intelligent agents on the net and stuff like that. And this suddenly an explosion of people talking about intelligence or intelligent agents without ever really addressing exactly what they meant by intelligence. And I decided it was really important for me personally, uh, particularly in my relationship to um, my relationship to the computer, my relationship as a programmer and often as a computer designer in my work, to understand on a, on a tangible level the kinds of decisions and, and thinking processes that were necessary t as you set about trying to program intelligence. Because um, I felt that there was a lot of pressure being put onto the notion of intelligence, and I wanted uh, to, to, I wanted to really have a sense of what was involved. So I, I, I think of I think of the work I did for the Giver of Names as being a bit like a a, a performance piece, a very private, ten-year-long personal performance piece, where I dress in the drag of an artificial intelligence researcher and watch myself and watch what's involved and how programming decisions would ramify and change the the way that the piece unfolded, so, you know, sort of a very self-conscious process of designing and programming a piece of software, uh, which is kind of an indication of uh, the way I think about my own practice. I think, uh, for me anyway, as an artist using these technologies, it's impossible for me to use them without thinking about and addressing the broader implications of the technology in in my culture, philosophically, so, so, uh, sociopolitically, etc. And so there's always, even when I'm programming, I'm watching, I'm saying, oh, I made that decision, isn't that interesting? That was the easy way out, you know, uh, wonder how that will transform the end result. Uh, watching the whole psychology of programming, for example. Uh, so The Giver of Names was a really, uh, it's not really a, even a finished project, but it took up to this point about 10 years of work, working on other projects at the same time. but. Uh, really starting from uh, designing a knowledge base from scratch, thinking about what it means to try to represent ambiguity in the unambiguous space of the computer, uh, then thinking about what is a knowledge base, what, when you connect this piece of information to that, what are the implications of that connection and how is that best made, really building from the bottom up um, a visual perception system, a language system, and a knowledge base. It's important to know that the particular objects in the space were not um, the only objects that could be used in the system. You could put your head on the pedestal, you could bring stuff in. It was not specifically tuned to these objects. It's, it's, it's in a position to deal with anything you present it with, and it does its best to make sense out of them. <laughs> 
the sort of fog of references or the associations that are being generated by the objects of different colors. One of the most interesting things, if you spend any time with the giver of names, you start to realize that there's a real consistency in its response to things. Even when it says something that makes absolutely no sense and seems to be completely unrelated to the object, if you put that object back, it's something really similar, reflecting that its subjective perspective on whatever you've put in front of it is quite is Even the ways that it abuses language sometimes start to feel like um, like a dialect. So just here, you know, the processing, which is visible above the objects in identical scale to the objects, is looking for edges, then trying to get rid of shadows and reflections, trying to simplify, and then find outlines. <laughs> So you have moments always Now I can't, I don't know, but I assume that the strenuously tilted audacity was that gun at an angle somehow. I mean, I don't know. One of my favorites, I have to say, the the degree to which it seemed to pick up on the uh, on the notion of of horn as horny and horn as plenty uh, is it was kind of a, a pleasure. Um, uh, and I think it's important to recognize, uh, and this is something that I think goes through a lot of early interactive work as well, there's a very strong desire on my part to create work that surprises me, that transcends or ev evades my expectations, yet still reflects a kind of consistency or a coherence. Um, you see that when you look at, uh, at, even back to the earliest people thinking about interactivity, there's this, always this statement, I like to make works that surprise me. It's, a re it's really a constant, in, in, especially in the earliest work of interactivity. It's interesting that that, I think, has substantially changed. And you find now that people doing interactive work really think of the interactive system as a control system for something else. Very different relationship that's implied there. Not necessarily a wrong relationship, but quite a different, I think, reason for invoking and using interactive interfaces. Um, I'm going to, there's a lot to talk about at that piece, but I'm going to sort of rocket ahead and maybe in questions we can get back to some of the, some of the issues there. Um, the next thing I'm going to show is another surveillance piece. Uh, Let's see. Just a, just a quick question. What yep. is a database, like those words? Where, was it? Mm, the database is a complicated combination. Uh, I started uh, with WordNet, the Princeton lexicon, the on, uh, available online code and all that, the sort of 30 years of graduate students <laughs> typing in words. Um, it, it, had, um, it had a lot of uh, sort of noun hierarchies. Uh, vast, it's got 500,000 words or something. So it's, it's a very sort of vast and, 
bug-ridden but rather complete uh, map of, of English, it didn't have any of the syntactical information and none of the sort of uh, links between ideas of different, no, no links between like property links like an orange uh, or an apple is sweet or anything, you know, none of those sorts of links, more links within hierarchies. So I had to then find sources for, um, I had to design a, a grammatical syntax um, that was basically functional and then attach syntactical information to all those things and then uh, also did a lot of research with things like the Bank of English which is a really great resource online. Uh, the Bank of English is uh, a, a website of a, um, a large, I think it's Collins, a large British dictionary company and they have a free uh, sort of page that you can go to. They have very expensive services but a free page where you can type in any word and it gives you the um, the 40 words most likely to sit on either side of that word in a vast you know, 9 billion word database of transcribed English, of text, of newspapers, etc. So I tried to fill the links in the, in the knowledge base, not with my own idea of what those links should be, but using the sort of proto idea that the net would be the source for the data. Thinking ahead to a time which is, is now possible to have the machine do its own research on the, on the net, but thinking that any Essentially, the, the web is the ideal sort of training source for any, any electronic quasi-intelligence because there's vast amounts of data of questionable nature and questionable veracity, but a vast amount of data that's accessible, machine accessible. Um, and then it also has read a few novels because uh, it can read novels, parse them, look at the relationships between uh, like na the noun and the verb or the subject and the object and the adjectives ad uh, modifying the the noun, and for example, if someone said the farmer ate the red apple, well, there's a lot of information, a lot of common sense information available in that sentence, uh, that an apple can be eaten, that eating is something that a human being can do, because through classification systems it knows a farmer is probably a human being. It can collect these fragments of common sense. In fact, one of the next things the giver of names will be doing in its development is finding ways to generalize that information, to say, okay, I've got this long list of things that can be eaten. Is there a higher order concept that that, that takes all those into, you know, so it'll find food for itself rather than me telling it that, that eating is something you do with food. So there's trying as hard as I can. It's not, it's not really a strict learning system in any way, but I'm trying, using the model of teaching uh, in a more literal sense, the way we teach children is a way of, of filling, filling out and increasing the sort of interconnectedness of the, of the knowledge base. Uh, okay, so the next piece is sort of uh, works off the sort of, um, it's a sort of next generation or a pushing the notion of surveillance beyond um, uh, uh, watch into a more pointed area, a little more threatening area. And this, this sort of work started with a piece uh, that I did with an artist named Paul Guerin, um, a video artist, uh, working with a sort of more invasive notion, a more sort of terrifying surveillance system. Um, so I'll let this unfold as well. And this is live, the live footage of outside. The, the machine is um, uh, set up the, the, the program to be able to locate heads in the uh, exterior scene and to zoom. This is a digital zoom, which is why it's so grainy. Um, so sort of weightless. It's like a virtual weightless camera zooming in on the heads that are identified. You probably can't see, but there was a, a frame around the head there. Uh, I'm, it's a very complicated thing for me, this piece, because I'm actually quite terrified of what the algorithm is capable of doing. Um, there's a kind of, um, and I suppose there's a kind of a interesting question to discuss at some point about what I am doing as an artist generating such a, t in, a in a sense, such an invasive uh, algorithm. And it's a important part of the way I go about my work is exploring from the inside the way that these things are done and trying to understand 
uh, the implications from all the way from inside the code. This is the last hundred heads that have been gathered by the system playing back in slow motion. You notice that uh, the algorithm is somewhat flaky. It thinks that this was a head because it satisfied some of the conditions of headness. And uh, people were always very comforted when they realized that it was capable of making mistakes. Of course, any computer pushed to the point of trying to make perceptual decisions and complex judgments is capable of making the same kind of mistakes, perceptual mistakes that we make. So that's, that's, I think, a really important thing to realize. When you push machines to that level, they're as capable of making mistakes as we are, or more capable of making mistakes. I'm going to zip ahead, because I know we don't have huge amounts of time. Stop. Because I want to get to the last, the pieces from the last couple of years. The next piece I'm going to show is called Enchant, and it is a kind of, um, it's a, a branch off the tree of the computer <laughs> 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 similar software to what is running the giver of names, but instead of looking at objects, they are getting stimulation from the <laughs> to know that the chant comes about, it's a truly emergent chant, it's not scripted, I don't say, okay, all computers say this. They're chanting because they've got to the same, maybe quotation marks, state of Thank <laughs> you. 
then uh, it muses, in a sense, on those words. It's sort of like it's the way they looked at an object in the games, and it stimulates or modifies its internal state of activation based on that input, and then starts talking based on that stimulus, which makes it kind of a dissident. It makes it an outsider. It breaks away from the chant, from the group, but also starts spreading that information to its nearest computers, which breaks up the chant into a chaos of voices. zip ahead again, uh, but I think uh, it's very important with this piece um, to understand that there's quite a different model of interactivity working here, and kind of a, a pretty challenging one. At Ars Electronica, um, showing this work uh, under the glare of having it received the Golden Nika was a very interesting experience, especially because um, the festival uh, and the building that, that my piece was in was full of pieces with a very direct sense of interactivity. You did this, it responded in some way. Um, and this piece does not work that way at all. It's a social organization that has its own agenda. Uh, you're walking into it unannounced, it doesn't know you, it may choose to reject you if it feels overstimulated. It may listen to you if you pay attention, if you sort of introduce yourself, if you, uh, if you, um, are, some, are somewhat uh, respectful to it, but people had a tendency to walk right up, look for the interaction, get frustrated, and go out. It was very, very frustrating. And I had to talk at the, at the artists, uh, sort of, um, what they call it, artists forum afterwards, sort of, you know, talk about what I felt. I sort of talked talk about the problem, I think, of, of, a, of, a, of a really limited notion of what interaction can be. Because for me, interaction is a way of articulating and describing and simulating relationship. And the dominant relationship in most interactive pieces is a very simple one. I do this thing, the system responds in some way. And that's only one of an almost infinite number of possible relationships. And I think it's profoundly problematic that the sort of, that artists using interactivity have tended to focus on that one sort of user as God or user as, you know, getting direct response from a mere relationship. Not that that isn't totally appropriate for a lot of pieces, but it's become kind of a formula. And I think it really limits the possibilities uh, of the technology. Um, but unfortunately, what we have now is an audience that understands that this is what interactivity is supposed to mean. So people are looking for that reflexive relationship. And I, I found by 1990, I was tired of building mirrors. And that's what I felt like I was doing. The predominant, th the thing that was required of me as an interactive artist was to produce a response that the audience would recognize. And everything else about the piece was kind of irrelevant. As long as people recognized themselves in the mirror, they were happy. And that just, I felt that shut down a huge amount of the really important sort of explorations and possibilities. So it was a very hard, hard I really love this piece, I have to say. I mean, for me, it's... Uh, one of the most satisfying pieces I've ever done. But I know also it's very challenging for people to interact with. Um, the last thing I'll say about this piece is that there's um, a very special thing for me in this piece, which is the, the sort of linguistic texture of the moment just before the system is, starts chanting. What happens there is as the machines come to consensus, and this is happening in a very fluid way, you start to hear kind of semantic echoes, you hear a word, a related word, something that's, that sounds the same but is quite a different word, and then things slowly get together, a sentence, maybe a sentence said in the passive voice, in the active voice, um, different but similar adjectives used in similar sentences until all of a sudden it comes back to the chant. And that movement towards consensus uh, is one of the most, in the broadest aesthetic, you know, philosophical aesthetic sense, I suppose, one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my own work. I just, I love that moment, but it's a very hard thing to represent, of course, in, in, uh, in um, documentation. The other thing that's, that's, you really don't get from the documentation is the sense that each of these 
machines is talking from its own speakers. And so you, you can really hear each of the voices as well as the chorus together. And uh, that there's, you really can have a sense of this, the dynamics of that, of that uh, sort of community behavior. Now, okay, whoops. Uh, the next piece is the most recent one that I'm going to show, which is a piece that was commissioned for the Architecture Biennale in Venice this past year. Um, and it's kind of an interesting commission because uh, the, the, the Architecture Biennale was supposed to be all about buildings, 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 and uh, we were asked to. Um, to work on a counter program uh, because uh, now I'm, I have nothing to do with architecture personally, but some of the other members of the team are very much involved in um, questioning the role of or the, the predominance of buildings in architecture. But we wanted to focus on the importance of public space. So I worked with um, footage of, of the Piazza San Marco uh, doing watch like things, extracting the people, making the architecture disappear. And then uh, tracking the trajectories of each thing. If you know, these are all the pigeons. And my theory is they're actually in, in Arabic. They're writing the name of God. And <laughs> all the tourists are getting in the way, so they have to keep, keep doing it. Uh, every, but you're getting the trajectory of every flying pigeon, everything. So it's a really sort of um, short-term dynamic plot of the social activity contained and defined by the architecture of the, of the space. This is a big tour group coming through, actually bleeding their way down. This is another uh, process that does a very tight uh, video feedback loop so that each person becomes a procession in themselves, which gives you two things. One is a kind of an interesting, I think, reference to the fact that this is a place of procession, both military and uh, religious procession. But also you get a map and a longer term of the kinds of movements uh, in, the, in the piazza. And then the final thing is back to uh, re reflection of watch extracting all the movement from it and only showing the people selling the corn for the pigeons and the architecture itself. And this was constructed in such a way that uh, you only saw the first two images initially, th this side, which were quite inexplicable, quite hard to, to, uh, to locate, and then came around a corner um, to this image, which was very strong, but only had the context revealed at the final the final piece here where suddenly people said, oh, OK, I'm going to go back and see all these again uh, from the notion of understanding what the context was. Unfortunately, I couldn't do this one live. It's the first time I've done a piece like this using, in this case, it was using, uh, unfortunately, a DVD because Piazza San Marco was too far from the pavilion, and it would have cost $200,000 to get a live satellite feed. It was kind of um, frustrating because it would have been very nice to have it live, but uh, c'est la vie. Um, the final piece I'm going to show is quite different. Uh, it's kind of interesting to know that it was um, it was developed at exactly the same time as Enchant, and whereas Enchant is a completely fabricated piece which pulls things out of unreality uh, that deals with only the realm of language and 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 information to this piece called uh, Machine for Taking Time, which is very grounded in the real world, in fact. So this video camera doesn't actually do this this quickly. It does this over the course of an hour, taking 1,080 stills from each of the positions along this cinematic trajectory every day. And it's been doing this now. We have about uh, 800,000 images in the, in the knowledge base at this point, or the, da the database. So if you can imagine, there are 1,080 positions, and then those positions replicated every day. And think of this big sort of chart of, of uh, space and time. and um, in this projection, for this projection, the computer uh, wanders constantly through this database, sometimes moving along a, a, the trajectory on a single day, and sometimes moving backwards or forwards in time at various rates, and sometimes jumping randomly, uh, keeping always the physical continuity, but uh, leaping about in, in time. Um, ironically, I, I, I thought initially that this piece was going to be, among other things, a sort of uh, almost um, 
lyrical evocation of the slow pace of change in the garden. What I didn't, what I've forgotten is that the garden is actually the first location of, of the act of editing, that the act of selecting plants from nature and putting them in various organizations is really the first time human beings actually edited. So there are actually some very brutal edits in this piece, despite um, the fact that it's based on the unfolding of, of the, uh, the, the, the uh, sort of very natural cycle, um, including one uh, tree that was blocking the view of the camera from one angle. And I asked the gallery director if it might be possible to just clip a few leaves off that bit of the tree. And um, uh, she said, well, I'll ask the gardener. and." Uh, the next day, there was a huge storm, and half the tree was blown over, solving the problem. <laughs> um, I, this was a very painful piece to do for one very silly reason. Uh, I miscalculated and put the, um, the whole camera structure, which had a very a real precision stepper motor on it, I put it on a big rafter, a wooden rafter, coming out from the structure of the of the building, and some of you have probably already realized that uh, in temperature and humidity shifts, this is going to have a big twist on it. And so um, I had to uh, spend a month writing an algorithm to match the exact positions of all the existing uh, images, um, which was a bit challenging because the images are changing day to day. So I know a lot about aligning images now, more than I think I ever wanted to know. Um, I think, I mean, this piece just unfolds, so I think it might be, uh, I would be, think it would be interesting to open things up to, to, to questions, because I love answering questions, and you'll probably get more focused information out of me that way now. So I'll just let this unfold, and we'll get into questioning. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you. It's a very truncated in a way. I tried to show a lot of work and didn't do as much talking as I usually do in the middle. So we'll get the talking in now. Yes, I, I really hope that you will use this opportunity to ask all those questions that you have surely in your mind after David's presentation. So, and uh, you were the first one. In your uh, initial uh, thing there, the, the, the music uh, and the person interaction, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, did you find any uh, significant difference between the interaction of professional dancers mm -hmm. and the general run? Yes, uh, very much. Um, the most satisfying people were actually amateur dancers, interestingly enough. Professional dancers were sometimes wonderful, but they gen tended to have um, a, a very clear vision of, of, of what their movements should be like. And that meant that they often worked against the system or weren't willing to, to sort of reimagine their movements in relationship to the system. So it was often people who had a strong interest in dance but were not professional dancers that, that really produced quite remarkable performances in the space. Although some of the best dancers that have ever been in the space produced ex really unbelievable performances where they really embodied the notion of the, of the, of the music on their flesh and of sort of that, that really direct connection was very you know, articulated. Um, but often just random people would do really interesting things in there as well. Um, often, in fact, the people who had moved most interesting, we, interestingly were very shy. And you'd, it often at, at shows at openings there would be people sort of in the corner like this watching everyone else in the installation. And what, waiting, hoping everyone would leave. And eventually, it was really interesting to watch sort of the trajectory of their desire of their overcoming of their fear of, of uninhibited movement in the space. And they were often remarkable once they got past that fear. So it was, there were a lot of things going on in a sense in that piece as a, as a, uh, um, in terms of people's relationship to their bodies, certainly. And, and it was all over the place. The most surprising people would do really kind of beautiful, profound uh, pieces in there. One had to be uh, reminded of a musical instrument uh, Oh, back in the 20s and 30s, which was uh, revived for uh, that uh, famous uh, uh, background music in Spellbound, mm -hmm. uh, the theremin. The theremin, indeed, yep. Very strongly. Uh, uh, many people make that connection, and I was aware of the theremin, uh, and uh, uh, I've heard, actually, I haven't seen the film about theremin, but it's apparently really quite fascinating. Uh, yeah. Thanks. <laughs>
So the next question. This is, this is in relation to the same uh, uh, installation, the uh, of nervous system. What uh, have you ever thought about adding, say, a visual aspect to it, as far as visual imaging or any type of thing like that, or do you think that would ruin it? Um, the very first versions had visual elements to them. Very, very simple. Uh, that was all done with the, the original ones with uh, an Apple II, and so there was a limited amount you could do graphically with an Apple II, but it had some interactive video exploiting some very low-level routines and things. And that was interesting, but what I discovered was that um, it made a big difference to the experience of the, of, of the space. As soon as you have something to look at that, you, that is related to what you're doing, you leave a sort of, you're no longer inside your body in the way that's most effective for a very nervous system. Um, there are a lot of interactive pieces that use silhouette or, or body image for video interactions. And I, from my perspective, I found them interesting, but for what I was interested in, really unsatisfying, because I immediately felt that I was watching my shadow and inhabiting my shadow rather than myself. And uh, to me, it stopped being an interesting thing, uh, an interesting discussion about the body then. It was more a, a sort of, it, and it entered the visual realm, which was, it was just quite analytical. And often these pieces are, you, know, you touch an icon, it makes a sound or something like that. It's often very interesting pieces, but quite separate from what I was interested in. Now, even uh, sometimes science museums have said, you know, we want to show this piece. And I say, well, you, and they say, can we have a visual component? And I say, well, here, I'll set it up. You can work with it, and then I'll put a visual component. And they go, and they have the experience, and they realize, yes, there's a big difference. And they will often say, OK, we don't need that. Well, uh, okay, so reverse, I'll give you the. Oh, I'm sorry. What, what about a visual component, say, for the observer, not for the performer? I, I'm just your thoughts. Uh, yes, that's that's fine, um, and it's very easy to do. And I think there are lots of people actually doing that uh, now. Um, it's it's never it's. You know, sure, it's fine. It's not, never not anything that's been a priority for me. Um, uh, I think, in fact, I mean, in a piece like Watch, I actually am letting people see the processes, i.e., that are going on in there. But I don't like to have people considering um, too many things at once sometimes if there's a very focused thing I want them to get at. And if you give people the wrong set of inputs, they will fixate on the things that are somewhat more trivial, especially if you're dealing sound. That relationship to sound is quite unfamiliar. And if you give people something too comforting to attach to, they will sometimes not have as strong a relationship to what's actually happening. Actually, watching a person moving in the space is quite strong in itself. Uh, you, don't, you don't sort of need that augmentation. And I don't like to add those things unless they're necessary, I guess. I but, think the visuals are. The visuals are the the body. You know, it's it's either a very internal process where you're feeling it and moving your body, or if you're yeah. observing, you're watching the person moving, and those are the visuals. Yeah. And to translate that into some kind of abstract graphics, I think would almost trivialize the the focus on the body movement. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true from the viewer's perspective as well. That it is. I mean, really, when you're watching a dancer, you're doing all of those computations as well. Your eye is calculating the trajectories. And I kind of like the fact that there is, that you're, that in some situations, you're nakedly doing that. You know, it's your own experience there. And also that you, I have a problem with performances, dance performances, for example, where you have a huge screen and a tiny little dancer. I mean, sometimes they work well. But for me, I want to be watching the dancer. And I want to try to, there's a temptation to have this huge, spectacular projection screen. And unless it's really the point that you're dealing with this ghost projection huge thing, I think it's always a problem of uh, like s dividing the attention of the viewer into the parts that's looking at the dance and the parts that's like the big competition with the big screen. In the kind of thing that I was doing, I wanted the direct like the dancer to be in their body and us to be watching that organic physical body at the same time. Okay, so the, you were the next, and then after. Um, regarding the same installation, um, have you ever considered um, using tactile feedback by having motors or some other um, uh, physical stimulation attached to the mover's body um, so that a movement would create um, a tactile response mm -hmm. and that they would react to? And, and so that would, they would not only be responding to the sound, but mm -hmm. also to uh, physical feedback. Well, 
They are. They don't need it. It's not uninteresting to add it, but the whole proprioceptive system inside the body is having, while you're moving, a profound sensual experience of the location, the, the distension of one's muscles, etc. And because those particular sensations are profoundly related to what you're physically doing, they seem more relevant. And I did not want to cloud those with extraneous stuff from the outside. It's not that I don't think that's an interesting idea. It's just that, again, I found there were some really interesting things going on internally to people in that installation. I didn't want to distract from that. Could run into negative reinforcement. Sure could. So, I have a, a, I guess, a question about your process. Mm -hmm. um, you, for a very nervous system, you worked on it for over 10 years. Mm -hmm. Give her games, you've been working on for about 10 years now, I guess, mm -hmm. and continue mm -hmm. to work on it. And I guess my question is, um, how do you decide when you're done? Huh. And, and and is it is it kind of advances in technology that are allowing you to do more, or is it or is it just take that much time to really get your algorithm straight? Um. With pieces like Very Nervous System and The Giver of Names, I'm taking on a lot more than a piece. Uh, I'm taking on um, usually a state of mind, uh, the state of mind of an artificial intelligence researcher or something else, um, usually learning a lot of technology in the process uh, and experiencing that and how those that's changing my relationship to things. Uh, I imagine I, I think I will always have those sorts of projects floating around. I'm looking forward, the next thing I'll be doing probably is going back to the giver of names for the next stage of development. There's something about the uh, that kind of project that you can just layer and layer and dive into. It's extremely rewarding to me. The sort of the voyage of working on those pieces is uh, it's amazingly uh, rewarding process that has taught me so much about, about perception, language, I mean, it's important, I think, uh, in those kinds of processes, one of the things that I'm really trying to understand, something I haven't talked about at all in this talk, is that one of the most important things to me is to find ways of learning, discovering, sensing what's, what, is, what a computer is really about. Like, I've, I've designed them and built them from scratch. I've written computer languages. I've, I've, I've written lots of programs. I've worked on, on top of that, you know, layered upon using tools, developing tools, using tools. Um, I'm really interested in understanding what is special about a computer, what they're really good at, what they're really bad at, and also how that relates to what we're really good at and what we're really bad at. For example, in The Giver of Names, a lot of the motivation was to try to understand in the idea of in what you know, I, I think in, I think there are lots of parameters and dimensions of intelligence that we don't really respect very much in ourselves. We are so familiar with ourselves, you know, we're so used to being ourselves that we can't really see some of the exceptional things that we're doing all the time, working with language, working with vision, not to mention things like consciousness. Um, and it's very interesting for me working with computers, trying to make them do similar things. Not necessarily trying to make them be convincing simulations of human beings, but to discover exactly how and when they fail, what parts of what we do are mechanical and easily reproducible. And when you get rid of those, what's left about what we do? That we, and it really helps me to understand what we don't understand about ourselves and our culture. And these are things that are really hidden from us. So in a way, I often use the computer as this kind of prosthetic way of perceiving myself stepping way outside of the subjective reality of being me and getting this really unsentimental uh, but really kind of different alien perspective on myself, which I can't get from inside or from talking to other people. So there's always, I mean, when I'm working on a large project like that, I'm taking on a lot of things and I always want to be taking those things on. The other projects are leafs off these processes. Sometimes they're just things I saw while I was working on a project. Um, watch just came out of suddenly being able to see inside the processes that the that very nervous system had been doing for 13 years. Uh, I'd never really seen what was going on inside, and I had in my own mind what was going. I thought I knew, and I'd been working with it for so long. When I finally saw the images, it was like, "Whoa! This is not what I expected, and it's very resonant for me." So that piece just sort of sprung out, almost fully formed, out of stuff that was lying around, and I think. One could say, well, that's kind of, you know, uh, 
uh, opportunistic. You know, you find this cool effect and you make a piece out of it. But I think, uh, especially in terms of this technology that is such a force and factor in the way our culture is unfolding now, that that the that it's 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 desirable and interesting to 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 really explore those things as they become apparent as well and to try to articulate them. I mean, I see these things. Sometimes my pieces are like reports on my research. Like, I've seen this, I would like you to see it too. I found this resonant, rich, uh, I would like to share that with you. And that's kind of a different thing from the other pieces. So there's sort of two different tracks there. The Giver of Names is very focused. I knew exactly what I wanted from that piece. And it's generated all this other stuff. And the other pieces are sort of, wow, that's, people should see this, you know, people should see that. Okay, so I will give for you and then for you. Okay. I'm kind of curious as to what you were talking about in terms of control mechanisms as opposed to interactive mechanisms. Uh -huh. And it strikes me that um, the way you go about changing something from a control mechanism to an interactive one is by making it non-deterministic. And if you're going to make it non-deterministic, do you include an element of randomness? Do you include a disassociated thing? And is there any way for you to include a disassociated thing that's intelligent, that, that makes sense in a way that, say, a computer can perceive an association? Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the best way to answer that, especially the, I'll get at the randomness question first, because it's very related to where a lot of the early ideas for a very nervous system came from. And, and, um, I was, uh, at art school, I, I was, uh, a lot of my teachers were friends or real followers of John Cage and people like that. And if you think of what John Cage did as a composer, he constructed a set of rules, which we could call a program in a certain sense, and then he would throw the dice or he would do the I Ching or flip a coin to make decisions about how those rules would unfold particularly and result in a, in a finished work. I found that really interesting, but I found it, for me, an interesting shift on that to replace the random number generator with the complex behavior of a human being, which is not random, but is very, very complicated. And doubly, it's not just complicated, it's conscious and reflexive and would respond to what was to, to the nature of that relationship. So uh, it, in most of my pieces, there is maybe a minor use of randomness where there is a decision, where there doesn't seem to be a reasonable way to make it interactively. Um, you know, uh, there, are, there are, for example, when the giver of names generates a sentence, I haven't figured out any really good reason to use a definite or an indefinite article, to use a or the in a sentence. Sometimes it's constrained by grammar, but often it's, so that's generally a random choice. But I use the random choice only when I don't have a better reason. Um, and in fact, oh, well, uh, the use of randomness in Enchant is a really kind of interesting and complicated thing, which I don't think there's time to go into. Uh, I did a lot of research into randomness for that piece um, because I both needed really unpredictable random numbers, but where I could have a kind of synchronization of that randomness to make the to to allow the possibility for the chanting to emerge. That's a, it is a kind of obscure area. I don't think it's it's worth going into right now. Well, the, uh, the, the reason I'm kind of pondering this is that it strikes me as if you have something. Um, like the giver of names that you mm -hmm. were talking about, create these nonsensical sentences mm -hmm. that are nonetheless grammatically correct. Mm -hmm. um, it would be a measure of intelligence to identify the sentences that do make sense as opposed to the sentences that don't make sense. And For a, a part of the system to identify that. Or, you know, or yeah. an observer or anything. Right. And is there any way to program that kind of thing in? To, you know, approach intelligence from the other way. Um, well, it is, I mean, in a sense, it's tricky, especially, I mean, yes, you could have something internally that would sort of randomly generated sentences and sorted them according to their relative sense making. The part of the problem is uh, getting a good common sense database, a database of common sense is, a, is kind of a bit of a holy grail, something that would actually make appropriate determinations of the relative sens sensibility of or senseness of a, of a sentence. Uh, but in terms of human beings participating in that, I did think of having human beings sort of grade things, you know, okay, so was that a good statement by the giver of names about that object? Um, I didn't really want to go there because I'm also really interested in the way that one's own mechanism of sense-making is seduced by anything that's grammatically correct or appears to be 
constructed uh, appropriately, we can't help but infer that it's attempting to make sense. And so we infuse it with sense. We find ways of, sh of, of flipping to another synonym for that word and, and maybe ignoring the comma because it makes more sense without that word. You find yourself reassessing the sentence until it makes sense because you can't. It's like the way we turn everything into a story. We turn everything into something that, and we try to turn everything into something that makes sense. So there's already this process overlaying it. And frankly, I'm, I'm, I'm always interested in keeping that element in all my work, the active relationship of the viewer. And I don't want to get too tricky with um, the, an adaptive nature of the piece because that clouds the adaptive nature of the person. It's kind of a tricky thing. I, I should also say that I have a complicated relationship to the notion of learning in my pieces. Um, people often ask, you know, does this learn? Could it learn? Should it learn? I, I have a complicated feeling about that because any way I know of making a system learn is a bit of a fabrication. Um, uh, because in some way or other, the programmer has set the goals, set the parameters, uh, and it, it, to me, the, the it, look, thinking about learning has forced me to, in, to, to sort of come up against the notion that um, beyond our, the question of artificial intelligence is this problem of artificial desire. Machines don't have desire. And learning comes out of, as far as I'm concerned, especially the real leaps that characterize human learning come out of those desperate situations where desire for survival, desire for something, force you out of your whole framework to, to come up with a whole new way of approaching things. And without some way of having overpowering, like almost self-destructive desire in the machine, there's a kind of learning that's not possible. And I don't want to cloud that by playing clever games of learning, which are very interesting and very useful, but not as interesting to me because I'm trying to get at something else. OK, so we have um, time for uh, just a few questions. Uh, you were. Uh, I just wanted, I was very interested in the societal aspect of Enchant, like the sort of emergent society. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any plans to create like distributed versions of this that would be working in multiple locations and interacting, like perhaps even in different countries where uh, translation is, is occurring. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the original plan for the giver of names included the uh, sort of a, the idea of a CD-ROM with the software that people or a uh, program one could download. It's a rather huge knowledge base, so it's a bit unwieldy. Um, that, so people could be separate nodes of that community. Um, and I, that would be something worth pursuing, but not exactly in the framework of Enchant, because as, the, as I work through the process of making Enchant, and usually with a piece, I have a very specific set of things I'm trying to get at, and I discover along the way the really resonant key features of that thing. It shifted away from um, a notion that was compatible with that notion of network. I think there's a very interesting possibility to, 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 to do a, a, a different piece exploiting that notion. But for this piece, the, the one's ability to determine in, in a spatial way, as even, the state of the whole network became very important. And a lot of the, the key stuff was there. And that would be lost if you're hearing through you know, an MP3 recording coming at you, slightly time delayed from what yours is doing sort of thing. But it, I, I find that a very interesting direction to pursue. I haven't found the, the hook that makes me think that I've got figured out a way that would, that would be really more than just interesting. So perhaps one or one or two questions uh, more, if there are any. Okay, so we we have one here. Sarah Roberts. Hi, um, uh, Without it make, I mean, I know you just said that you didn't want to get into this, but okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> But the model for going, if, if it's not too hard to, to make a sort of analogy of, the model for going from, for reaching consensus in Enchant would be really interesting to hear about. OK. Will do. Um, uh, you need to know a bit more detail about the giver of names, just a little bit more. Uh, the knowledge base of the giver of names and Enchant is made up of about 100,000 words and ideas. And each of those words and ideas has a sort of a, a variable degree of current stimulation and actually has, a, has also a historical sense of how often it's been stimulated recently 
for reasons, for very important reasons uh, that might be too much to go into right now. Let's just say that, it, that if, if you don't have a sense of historical stimulation, the thing has a tendency to be obsessive and uh, get stuck on certain ideas that it won't let go of. So, so that's just, just to say that there is this underlying balancing thing that keeps it from obsessing about particular ideas. Um, but in, in any given moment, there's the amount that, a, that a, each, certain, each idea is stimulated, and I think of that as like a terrain or a landscape. You think of the things that are very stimulated as being mountain peaks and the things that are really not stimulated being valleys. And that this terrain is absolutely unique for every kind of object that's put in front of it or every selection of objects. So there's a, it's an interesting thing to think about the giver of names as a very, very interesting kind of human interface where the interface are the objects being presented and that the reach, the number of possible outcomes in interacting with that interface is enormous. And the response to each combination of things is quite unique. So anyway, that's just to set the stage for that. Now, what happens in Enchant is that there, is, there are two sources of stimulation for each of those systems. One um, are, these, are the sort of broadcasts from each of the other members of the community. Um, every, every time they say a new sentence, they also broadcast the new idea that they moved associatively to in their stream of consciousness so-called stream of consciousness, you know, from, from round to rolling to wheel. You know. So we, they broadcast that. They sort of yell it out on the network. And that stimulates every other of the systems on the network to increase the stimulation of that idea. And the stimulation doesn't just go to that idea, but spills over into associated ideas. So orangeness stimulates the fruit orange, the color orange, things that claim that they are orange, associations of orangeness, like Irish Protestants and, you know, uh, you know, many different, you know, so really it sort of flows out in a lot of directions like the ripples of, uh, of a pond after a pebble's been dropped in. And so, th but so this is what's happening uh, when they talk to each other, when they, they announce these things. And there is a kind of mutual reinforcement that happens because of that. And it is that mutual reinforcement that results in a sort of synchronization of the states of mind out of which I, uh, similar and then identical expression comes. Now, there are a couple of tricks there. It's not 100% emergent out of nowhere. The process of coming to cons consensus is completely emergent, but I had to lay some constraints to make it even possible. The first issue is that there is a certain amount of uh, randomness, as I mentioned, in the decisions like, do I use a uh, or the? Um, and I needed to constrain those so that it would, there would be a similarity between what the things were saying. So there's a way in which also they broadcast their sort of random number seed to each other so they can synchronize up their random number generator. Uh, the second thing is they're using identical knowledge bases. I'm very interested in the notion of, of, of each of a knowledge base being a point of view. And I was intrigued by the notion of using different knowledge bases for each. But it, I, I did not believe that I would be able to, to create an emergent chant out of that. So it seemed like a necessary constraint that the knowledge bases be the same. Um, the third thing that I do is I have the overall stimulation for everything in the knowledge base be a little more aggressively depleted after every sentence than it is in the giver of names. And the giver of names, it's still kind of got in mind a number of things it's seen recently. There's the, the context in which it sees each new object is formed a lot by the previous objects that it's seen. In Enchant, it's a little more aggressively, sort of all the stimulation is a little more aggressively damped each time it says something, so that there, because otherwise there's no way they would come to synchronization. Uh, so that's kind of how it works. And uh, I was very happy that's, that all, that's all I had to do to get it to chant. I was prepared, of course, to force it to chant if it was absolutely necessary, because that was essential to the piece. But it would have, I, I would have been really disappointed if I'd had to be aggressive about that, because it is precisely the emergent nature of that chant that provides that sense of growing consensus. Um, it, the chant doesn't come in a predictable way. Uh, it emerges at variable time depending on the overall state of the system. Sometimes they get close to a chant and then it breaks up into little groups, these two and these two and these three, and then this one goes over to there. This is all this social reorganization that happens. Sometimes 
they, there's these sort of little blips, like people in church reading from different sort of you know different versions of the prayer book or something, uh, slightly different word uses and things like that. Incidentally, one of the things that's interesting to know about this piece is that my father is a minister, and I spend a lot of time, quite bored, frankly, uh, standing in church. And one of the most interesting things to me was listening to the sounds of the voices. I didn't realize that this was one of the motivations for the piece until the piece was done, but it was definitely an undercurrent there. Does that yeah. okay Thank give you, you a sense of that? Uh, I sh is a kind of interesting thing. The challenge of getting Enchant to, to behave that way was a really interesting one to me. There, I've been very interested in things like cellular automata, which are uh, systems with very simple rules that display complex behaviors. Uh, and I was interested in seeing if it was possible to generate a kind, that kind of complex pattern generating thing with some coherence out of very complex units. Because in the game of life or other cellular automata systems, the automata have extremely simple rules. And I wanted to see what would happen with extremely complicated rules and whether there was a way to constrain that. Because that seems to be what happens socially. We find ways to, to generate almost, almost quite predictable or characteristic behaviors, each of us with our absolutely different subject, subject of reality. That's n I'm not exactly mapping that in the giver in, in Enchant because I have made these constraints. But I was interested in just pers just looking at what happens there and what's possible. Okay, so I think the uh, time is up. Um, so I, uh, knowing that uh, <laughs> David has been showing work and actually giving talks all around the world, I think it was just it was about the time to get to Los Angeles. This was the first talk here, and I I hope we'll have a chance to see some of the work, experience some of the work, and have David back. So thank you very much, and uh, thanks for the audience. Thank you.